Remember how words of radiance snatched my soul, tore it to pieces and left me in tears while burning my heart to a crisp? Well, I learned nothing from that and I proceeded to read Oathbringer. I'm something of a masochist, so here we go again, baby. <laughs> Oathbringer is the third set of trauma in the ongoing series of trauma hiding behind the attractive name of the Stormlight Archive. We've all been baited, we've all been fooled, and we're all addicted to the pain. Nice to see you here in this therapy session, Gancho. Let's once again take a walk through our collective odium-filled nightmare. Oh, it's journey? Journey before destination, that's what people say, right? I don't know, I failed my radiant test. The book opens on Ashonai's point of view. Okay, sure. And we learned that the Parshendi were the ones to send Zeth to kill Gavilar. Sick. Wait, was I supposed to know this already? This is news to me, but it feels like I should have known about this somehow. Oh well, the ex-king is gone, so who cares? You know who else is gone? Sir, a corpse has been discovered in the corridors. Holy Stormfather! A corpse? High Prince Toral Sadias has been murdered. <gasps> Murdered? Not saddy ass. What a tragedy. You guys can't even begin to imagine the massive smile that appeared on my face. My girl Polona joins me on the fun. She looks at saddy ass's body and goes, Well, I guess that's one problem solved. What? Don't tell me you weren't all thinking it. I like this woman. Getting rid of saddy ass means we have one less thing to worry about as Dalinar is deep in politics now. He vowed to never touch a sword again. He wants to unite through diplomacy. I say grab a shard blade just for show at least maybe other high kings will listen to you because i'm sure you realize nobody gives a crap right now it's okay buddy they're just jealous do you see them walk around communicating with the sky no speaking of which it just occurred to me that delinar bonded the stormfather meaning the stormfather is his friend that's a massive spren you got there buddy now i know delinar is a bondsmith new order unlocked and new wife unlocked we can't avoid talking about Navai because a third of Dalinar's chapters are dedicated to how much he worships Navani. Which is funny because he avoids getting physically closer to her at all costs. Every time she tries to hold his hands and do a little tango, he's like, nah. For somebody defying the very existence of God, you're so hung up, Dalinar, to legalize hand-holding. They get married. Yeah! We've been waiting for this. So much I even dressed up for the festivities. And oh boy, was I disappointed. It's like... Really? You made me wait for this moment a long, long time for this. This is the most boring wedding I've ever seen. Hey there, my dudes. So, tell me, do you like oaths? Hell yeah. Yup. Cool. You're married now. My job here is done. Bye. What? Unbelievable. Oh well, at least Dalinar won't have any excuse when Navani wants to fu- I mean, seduce him. No transition, we're cutting to Kaladin. What is our international sad boy TM up to? He went back home where his parents are still alive and where he punched Roshon. Thanks, that made my day. But here's a slap for still calling Moash a friend. Okay, now that's done. Cute alert! Kaladin has a new baby brother. I don't know how, but I knew it. As soon as his mother was like, Kaladin, there's something you need to know. We- and got interrupted, a small voice at the back of my mind screamed, BABY! Kaladin crying when he saw him was heartwarming and heartbreaking. We miss you, Tien. While we're on the topic of babies, in order to fight the depressi, Syl gives Kaladin the best advice, doing the devil's tango. Yep, she's right. That'll make you happier. She also casually announces slipping under people's locked doors to study. Well, thanks. Now every time I dance, I'll picture his friend staring at me. Kaladin wants to hear none of that. He's too busy being a messiah. Or so he thinks, wanting to save everything and everyone but himself. He did it with Bridge 4, he does it with another group later on, and right now he's trying it with Parshman fleeing slavery. He gets captured, but even then, they're friends. Kaladin's hanging out with the runaway Parshman giving them survival tips. What is this? A scout group? This time spent with a Parshman reminds me of something though. Where's Eshonai? The question leaves my mind immediately because look who's standing there. Renarin! I've said it and I'll say it again a million times. Renarin is 
precious. So precious he doesn't even need to do or say anything. I just want to hug him so much. I'm jealous of Adolin. He can hug him. These two have such an adorable sibling relationship. I love them. Renarn said he discarded his shard blade, but he actually made a new one for himself. And judging from the short description, it seems to fit him better than the one Adolin gave him. He felt bad not being able to use that shard blade properly, but he just needed something that fitted him more. This sparks joy. I'm happy. Also happy that Renarn is starting to show some truth watcher signs. He knows tons of things. His brain works too fast for his lips to follow. His hands are glowing with healing powers. I need Renarn chapters. I'm dying to know more about my order. And about the radiance in general. Something radiant just happened when Adolin held Renarn's hand. Same as when Shalan and Delina were in the same room. And in both instances, something strange yet incredible happened. Adolin's injured wrist is fine now and Shalan was able to bring a map to life. Based on these tiny incidents, I suggest all the radiants just hold hands. You, night. Oh, one second. Moshi moshi. Oh, no, there's been another murder? Good thing that we have here, Detective Kaya. Let's see, a guy from Siberial's arm killed the exact same way as Sadias, abandoned the exact same way as Sadias, found the exact same way as Sadias. Hmm, I see my boy Adeline shaking in the corner over there. So either Adeline is out on a killing spree or we're dealing with a copycat. Dun dun dun. Thank you, thank you. Detective Kaya at your service. Now Detective Kaya wants to know why Adeline is insisting on there being two different killers? Just admit you killed Sadias at this point. Maybe it'll make Shalan feel less guilty about murdering her parents. Two killers made for each other. I'm not even kidding. These two make such a good couple. They appreciate their mutual strangeness. They practice together the bunks. They share food. By the way, never trust a man with your food. Shalan trying Adeline's spicy food and regretting her life decisions is me believe in Adam every time he told me, try it, it's not too spicy. Lies. Only lies. Oh, but I almost forgot. They are so horny for each other. Mostly Shalan. She looks at Adeline's lips. She thinks of creative applications for her tongue. She really wants to see his thigh birthmark. Give me a sec. I'll call the Stormfather so you two can praise the oaths. Honestly, I love horny Shalan. But how do we explain this to Pattern? He thinks the definition of inappropriate is divided by zero. I agree, pattern. There's nothing worse than that. But then, bam, epiphany. He gets it and yells the most famous quote of the Stormlight series. No mating! And just like that, I finally got the no mating joke. Pattern, say that to Syl too. Between a doodle and an impure thought, Shalan meets Mraes. First of all, dude, I know it's your parents' fault, but consonants should never stand so close to each other in a name. Second, what are you still doing here? What do you want? Leave my girl alone. Oh, and look who else is back. Amaram. Really? Listen, I don't need this. Instead, I go witness the birth of Brightness Radiance, and my first move is writing an essay to my Cosmere informant about how I'm such a Shalan. I'll spare you that and just explain to you that I have a secondary self, a more confident and daring self that I summon when my basic self can't do it and Adam goes uh keep reading cringy face uh oh Shalan's going off the rails with her personalities but it sure is nifty the OG Shalan does scholar stuff radiant hits things and Veil vale does whatever Shalan needs her to do at a given moment right now she needs her to run around and collect clues on the killer and well Vale the detective is an awful detective. Put down that wine. You should stop drinking on the job. Booze is disgusting anyway and Stormlight Les Shalan will have a hell of a hangover. Detective Kaya has been observing Detective Vale's exchanges and there's something that catches my attention. The two murders at the tower are different from the two murders at the back of the tavern, but in both instances the murders are described as being the same. The exact same. There's always an emphasis on exact. Which makes me wonder. Could this be the work of a light weaver somehow? Like copying murders to pin it on the first killer? Theory immediately debunked because this was such a stupid thing for me to say. That's not even how light weaving works. What was I even thinking? Hey, Vale, we're both awful detectives. Wanna work together? At least Shalan is damn good at what she does. She produces a stage performance life for pattern? The girl who looked up. That's a play I wanna attend. But sadly, the only one watching Shalan is pattern and an evil spren in the audience. Wait, what? The 
his friend runs away, but we eventually find out what slash who it is. She's called the Midnight Mother, a super intimidating name for a massive oily blob. She's a very very old spren of the unmade type and she's the one behind all the killings because her hobby is mimicking humans. I don't mean to hobby shame you but find a better one? Also, oh, that makes more sense than all my poor attempts at solving this mystery. Listen, a detective's work is hard. Cut me some slack. Here's one thing I got right though. The pre chapters. I usually don't get them, but these ones. Whoever's talking in them calls themselves a heretic. <sighs> Yasna, if you were trying to hide your identity, try again. And these repetitive one-liners are ridiculous. What do you mean by, I know you're all gonna hate me, but I need to write this record. You won't understand anyway, but it's fine. Just listen to me. I need to write this record. I will confess everything. I have killed someone who loved me dearly. I need to write this record. Girl, shut up and tell us what you- We're starting the interludes of this book the good old way, with names in places I don't recognize. Pooley, the lighthouse keeper from the land of blue fellows that's very happy there's a new storm because he gets to pick up lots of wood. That's pretty much the interlude. And no, I don't get it. Alista, the ardent that just wants to be left the f alone. Everybody's yelling and stressing over the new storm, making calculations and going crazy because that's what math does to you. And my girl here just wants a quiet corner to read and fangirl at fictional characters. Ain't that all of us? Venli, the only name I know here but not much beyond that. She and her friends are walking a field of corpses led by a spren that is, and I quote, sent by Odium himself. Nothing about this sounds good. Nothing. Especially when we find out that one of the corpses is Eshonai's. Well, I guess that answers my question from earlier. I'm amazed that nobody thought Yasna was a ghost walking the hallways, but it doesn't matter. She's definitely back. Not much of a surprise for us readers, but how much of a shock is that to everybody in the book? Especially Shalan who saw her die. That's why their reunion is awfully disappointed. After going through the trauma of seeing her get stabbed and then grieving her for a long time, Shalan finds Yasna. And what does Yasna do? She goes full scholar mode and tells Shalan to get to work. Well, hi to you too, Miss ma'am who just came back from the f***ing dead? Really, Yasna? You somehow get resurrected and the first thing you do when you see your ward again is give her a lecture. I know this is Yasna being Yasna, but come on! You're Shalan's role model and her friend and she thought she lost you forever. Could you be any more of a dry, senseless, soulless rock? No offense to the actual rock. Tell me you didn't at least say hello to your mom. A reunion we didn't get to see, by the way. The only mention of it is Dalinar saying how emotional it was. Sorry, didn't see it, can't believe it. Speaking of Dalinar, he's got a genius idea to get to meet kings and queens against their will, dragging them into his nightmares from the past. Because they need to see, they need to understand what they're fighting against. Dalinar asks the Stormfather if that's possible and Stormfather goes, Oh, that? Yes, of course. Well, thanks for mentioning that, you dipsh- I didn't know you needed the information. Shut up. Let's move on to more pleasant things, like Bridge 4. Kaladin is now Bridge 4's Stormlight Power Bank and everybody can do some crazy stuff, like the Lopin trying out his Spider-Man moves by walking on the ceiling and confessing his love to the ground. Meanwhile, Sigzil is telling some nonsense story that surprised me until he mentioned how he was stopped by Master Hoyd. Oh! That explains everything. Kaladin makes a clumsy remark on Drehi being gay and the Lopin interjects immediately to say that, if anything, Drehi is extra manly because there are no women involved. Which is a hilarious but also brilliant way to put it. Thank you, Lopin. Renarin is slowly embracing his scholar side and everybody's happy for him instead of making fun of him for being involved in feminine things such as reading. Relaine is in need of company and Kaladin's there to lend an ear. And Rock is his usual delightful self, rewarding everybody's efforts with his cooking skills. Warms my heart to see such good friendship and acceptance. It's nice to get some good feels on this honor forsaken planet. Okay, now back to the dread. You audiobook listeners might not know this, but each chapter opens up with a specific icon depending on the character we are going to follow. There's a spear for Kaladin, pattern for Shalan, a bridge form uniform for the members of bridge form. So imagine how perplexed I was when I saw this. What? In the twilight zone? Is this sh The answer was the very first word of the chapter. M. 
O A S H. Excuse me for a second. Dude, my depression is already chronic. What are you trying to achieve here? How do I make you understand that I don't need this other than saying that I really don't need this? Ka yeah. Journey before destination. Journey before fucking destination. Let me start by saying there are way too many Moash chapters. Just seeing his name actually became annoying at some point. I really don't give a single crap about him, okay? Let him be lashed in the air like the freaking trash he is. I hope he chokes on his friend. Moash has got new friends, but uh oh, they die. And Moash is kidnapped by Voidbringers. Good, take him. Don't bring him back. You know what's the most infuriating thing about these chapters? Moash being taken and enslaved by the Voidbringers, him dwelling on everything he did and realizing his mistakes, it feels like I'm meant to have some empathy for him. Except it's not working. It never will. Whether it was Sanderson's intention or not, the whole woe is me act is BS to me. If anything, it makes me hate Moash even more. Oh. And you know what else makes me hate Moash even more? It's Moash thinking he's still part of Bridge 4. This is hilarious. I never noticed this before. What a funny guy you are. Now listen up, you little bitch. You're right about burning that patch. Just get rid of the whole uniform. You've already burned away your Bridge 4 membership anyway. Plus, don't think I didn't notice the dangerous energy building up around you, my guy. Moash is pretty much summoned by a fused who seems very interested by him, which cannot be good. She praises him for his passion and asks him what makes him feel such passion. He replies, vengeance. Seeing how his internal thoughts keep going on about Kaladin protecting a murderer and knowing that the f Moash moment is coming. I mean, I hope I'm just overthinking, but I swear to god, Moash. Such a single hair from Elikar's head and all. Let's move on to Yasna, teaching her uncle the ways of heresy. No, not really. She just basically tells Dalinar to ignore the bullies who call him a heretic, to which I say, no, give the middle finger to the bullies by embracing the heresy. That's what I did. True, half my family hates me and I would have been exiled if I hadn't left already, but hey, looks like being a heretic repels the bullies. It works wonders. Aside from her heretic status, I learned a couple things about Yasna. First, the fact that she was sick, maybe even mad when she was a child. Hmm, what's up with that? Second, she knows about what happened with the Radiance and she's keeping the secret from everyone. Where did you go and how did you get that information, lady? her free time, Yasna hangs out with her spren, an ink spren called Ivory that I can't help picturing like this. As you would expect from Yasna's spren, Ivory is very logical, perhaps overly logical, just like Yasna. Legend says if you look at Yasna from Shadesmar, you realize she has no soul. Makes me wonder how she bonded her spren to begin with, or Actually, it does make sense. Was this enough to make you understand that Ivory is not my favorite? Good. Moving on. Our boy Kaladin just keeps evolving. You know how he's already a human lamp? I now introduce to you the Storming Airlines. On board the Kaladin airship, Shalan, Adolin, Elokar, and a couple of bridgemen travel to Kalinar. Man, gotta love magic. Back in Yurithiru. 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 Thiru. Oh my god. <laughs> Eurythiru. Eurythiru. Back in Eurythiru, Navani and her acolytes are scratching their heads over the complex architecture of the tower. And as always, they forget to ask the opinion of a very important individual, Renarin. So while they were giving themselves a headache, Renarin actually achieved something. He found a hidden message in the very walls of the library, the same library they thought was lost forever. My sweet baby genius. Speaking of genius, I might be onto something here. Behold, Ganchos, here's my storming theory of the day. Let's pay attention once again to the pre-chapters. After Yasna came back into the story, the point of view in those pre-chapters shifted to somebody else and, of course, I got confused yet again. Until two words showed up and set off the rusty gears of my brain. Those two words are, I think. Therefore, I am in possession of a theory that might be a smidge far-fetched, but hear me out. First of all, these pre-chapters seem to be an exchange between two people or more, much like in the previous books, with the letter exchange going on between different entities of the Cosmere, which is something I was told about because I definitely could not make sense of any of that. So let's assume that's what's happening here. I couldn't make out the number of people involved in the discussion, but some pre-chapters sounded hostile, others were a bit calmer. But the one that really caught my attention is the same one that got me thinking about all of this. It goes like this. I would have thought before attaining my current station that a deity could not be surprised. Obviously, this is not true. I can be surprised. I can perhaps even be naive. 
I think. I think. Tell me our man Seiza did not jump to your mind just now. It's true I haven't caught up on the entire Cosmere just yet, so I can't safely assume that Seiza is the only character that almost systematically punctuates his lines with an I think. But he's definitely the only one I know who does. Plus, the bit that says before attaining my current status sounds like it refers to the time before Seiza's ascension to Harmony, which only further proves my point. I'm pretty confident about this part of the theory, but what does it really mean? Who are the people that Harmony? Harmony is talking to. First thought that comes to mind is other Cosmere gods. This might be true, but on to the next piece of evidence I've gathered. Assuming this is still Harmony talking, here's another very curious pre-chapter. Why have you not made yourself known to me before this? How is it you can hide? Who are you truly? And how do you know so much about Adonalsium? I don't know about you, but these are questions I would ask none other than Hoyd. And Hoyd communicating with Harmony and other deities doesn't sound too crazy, I think. Although, I don't know why they would send each other letters in a universe ruled by magic, but sure, whatever. I'm less certain about this second part. I'm not sure how Hoyd would contact gods on other planets, why he would do it now of all times or what he is trying to tell them. The Hoyt paranoid is a disease and I am definitely ill, but Sanderson has taught me to pay attention to every single word and it's true. Sometimes I go too far reading between the lines and coming up with stuff that isn't actually there. This time, I think it's no red herring. But that's just a theory. A Cosmere theory. And cut. Not really. Sit back down. I have another theory. Dalinar is still using his visions to unite and Navani and Yasna are now regular guests. In this one chapter, Yasna states that she could chronologically organize the visions based on context clues, except for the one where Kalinar is in ruins. And this remark definitely was a curious one in all of Yasna's scholarly blabbering, because I instinctively thought, if Sanderson made her say that, then it must be important. What if the destroyed Kalinar vision is not from the past, but of the future? We know that the fuse that go in there. I'm into anxiety, I am. But thank dead honor for the gift that is left because she lifts all of my fears and my sorrow. Lift appears in the most unexpected of places, right in Dalinar's visions, and she ruins them, and I mean it as a praise. This girl, in all her smallness, pops up and calls Dalinar old. Then she tells him he's got a nice butt, which is so f***ing creepy. Like, that made me imagine the tight butt on Dalinor? Please, Lyft, don't say that ever again. But I guess that's the best we can get because another visitor comes around and here's kind of the worst. Odium himself shows up in one of Dalinor's visions. I guess these visions are free real estate now. Odium goes on and on about passion and makes cryptic comments about honor and cultivation. I fell asleep somewhere there, but then Dalinor tries diplomacy and fails. Unite? More like you cry. At least we'll learn something important through a vision. The Herald's story and how they became crazy. They basically needed to keep the evil Voidbringers imprisoned in damnation, but being on duty involved getting tortured and that made their sanity go off the charts. So they quit, except one, Tal, the freaking madman. They left him, trusting for some reason that he would survive on his own, those cowards. And now, thousands of years later, the ancient spren known as the Voidbringers are back with a new band name, The Fused, and they're stealing the bodies of our poor regular parchment and getting revenge on the humans, a species that doesn't even know what's going on. But what can you expect of these sweet, ignorant souls when the heralds themselves are still wandering the planet, waiting for somebody else to fix their big oopsie? Time for some Xanax, give me a sec. New round of interludes, and this time we're starting with Kaza, a woman that is falling apart, quite literally. Very, very literally. All she needs is a passing wind sprint for her to lose a limb. She seems to be held captive on a ship, which must have been the Rosharan Titanic, because too bad for the captain and the rest of the crew, the ship sinks and they die. Kaza is the only one to survive, not for long, she ends up on an island and faces a walking pile of Kremlings, which is a type of creature I vividly remember seeing in Edge Dancer, because I thought it was Hoyt, not too far-fetched since he is a Kremlin. In other words, it's a sleepless. Other, other words, what the f***? 
What is it doing here? Where are we, even? And oh my storm father, did Kaza just make the island disappear? Next in line is good old Terra Mike. Today is a good day because he's got zero empathy, which means his intelligence is at max level. Basically, he'll watch you cry and yell at you to tone it down while snatching away your tissue to scribble his diagram on it. I must say, Terra Mike is an incredibly entertaining character. Very interesting as well. I like seeing his softer side on his not so good days. Should I feel a Offended? Why is empathy associated to stupid? And on his good days, he's quite the madman. Much like myself when I need to write the content you are consuming right now, past intelligent Terra Mike left notes to himself, which turned out to be the long list of numbers and some pre-chapters of Words of Radiance. Remember? I was on the right track, but then I gave up. What bothers me now is knowing that this guy, while at the peak of his IQ performance, placed all the letters of all his diagram genius notes to numbers instead of just writing them down. Oh, it's to prevent others to figure it out, you say? Well, that's not working very well. I figured it out. Or almost. I would've if I wasn't so lazy. Here's the translation that I just googled. Taramak praises his own genius and then he orders for a bunch of singing kids to be killed. What a delight. Last and very least, Venli. I don't like her much. Don't ask me why, I wasn't super into Eshenai either. I was just interested in the Barshendi as a whole and I could only see them through her eyes. At least Venli's point of view isn't boring. A spren entered her heart. And it would be kinda cute if said spren wasn't a void spren because as the name implies it. It's big, big trouble. Possessed by an evil spren, let's go! But it doesn't stop there. Venli isn't the only one possessed. All of her Parshendi friends are falling down, then waking up as a Voidbringer. But it doesn't stop there. Venli is in reality the only one not dying in the process of becoming a fused. Odium himself kicked out whoever was supposed to steal her body and chose Venli as his favorite playable character. And that, gentle people, is why you should always strive to remain an NPC. This part exhausted me for the simple reason that it drags out. This is the first time I feel like this about a Cosmere book. I usually enjoy the slower parts because they are more often than not careful build-ups and a good hunt for clues. But the culinar portion takes too much time. We need to open the oath gate, but before that, we have to get past the unmade taking the palace hostage. So what do our characters do? Elokar goes to parties and befriends the local light eyes. Dance dance, Elo. Adeline's his usual flamboyant self and flails around in his shiny garments. He's a fashionista, you see. Meanwhile, Kaladin is cheating on Bridge 4 with the wall guard and Vale is playing Robin Hood, stealing food from the rich to throw it at the poor and infiltrate this cult of weirdos dressing up as Spren. Cool, but can we get to the unmade of the palace, please? Not yet, because we have a guest. Gentle people, a round of applause for... <laughs> Wait, same old tendency of popping out of nowhere and disappearing just as easily? I don't have the energy to be mad anymore. Go ahead, Withoi, torment me! That's what I expected, but much to my surprise, he didn't. He actually was great? Wit started with a little performance in the streets of Kolinar, and you heard me complaining a lot on this channel about his stories not making sense. Well, some do. And this one was lovely. Great moment. Especially when he recognized Shalan under her veil disguise in the crowd. I remember I was surprised how nice Withoid was with small Shalan, but now I choose to just appreciate it because he seems to show kindness only to her. My emotions are being toyed with here, I am aware. I'll show no resistance this time though because behind his annoying over-the-top persona, Whithoid is actually a pretty good guy. I know, I can't believe I'm saying this either, but see, he just had to show his goodness. I wasn't being stubborn before, he was doing everything to be the most annoying possible. The most emotional moment to me was when he said to Shalan, it's alright to hurt, but don't think you deserve the pain. You know, you need to learn to forgive yourself. Ah, well, crying wasn't on my schedule today, but here we go. Thanks for the pep talk. Cause you're talking to me, Sanderson, right? I've asked you many times to get out of my head. Just kidding, you can stay. Rent free, buddy. Try to fix some stuff while you're in there. There's lots of loose cables and missing gears. Back to it. Among all the secrets he's keeping, he finally lets Shalon and us know a tidbit about his hoidness. A long, 
long time ago. We're talking several millennia and infinite lifetimes ago. He made a vow to be there when needed, but there being too vague of a notion, I'm guessing he's required to teleport all the time to finish his quests. And seeing how many worlds are on the brink of extinction and the general state of the Cosmere, good luck buddy. So, kindness and information. The only wet scenes I will tolerate are those he shares with Shallan. Since we're talking about redeemed and still redeemable characters, let's give a shout out to another one, Elogar. It's no secret that I really despised him before due to his questionable actions and the general unpleasant aura surrounding him. You guys mostly defended him and I needed to get to this book to understand why. Elogar first surprised me by giving his title as a king to Dalinar, which makes sense I guess. I just didn't and expect it from him. Even better, now that he's got a purpose with Kolinar and seems eager about helping out, I view him in a slightly better light. And seeing him make more and more efforts throughout this part really makes me appreciate him. You hardly ever see people mess up then try to better themselves the way he does, so kudos to him. I like this kind of development. As Wit put it, Elokar grows on you, like a fungus. I hope he doesn't disappoint me. May he find the road to redemption and only then can he leave my infamous Bish Square Club. If you recall, the official members are Amaram, Moash, Sadias, Elokar. No, Sadias being dead doesn't exclude him from the club. And if Elokar ever gets to leave, I'm sure we can find a replacement fast. There will always be candidates. And to make sure the square has one more spot to offer, how about we execute Moash? If you read the book, it is no surprise to you that all my hopes and dreams have been destroyed. And you know damn well what I'm talking about. Can I get a hell yeah to the most infamous moment in the whole Stormlight history, the f***ing Moash scene! Yay! There were too many Moash chapters, right? But then they suddenly disappeared. There were none. I should have been relieved, but not seeing him anymore actually got me concerned. And my intuition was right, because what I've come to realize is that Moash is just like a spider. His presence? Terrifying. But what's even more terrifying is his absence. So seeing what just happened, I am not laughing. This is not funny. This is awful and I hate everything. Just when we finally get to the palace to use the oath gate, Moash materializes from thin air and with a single stab ruins the f***ing book. Needless to say, I did not see that coming. Even though I did get the feeling that he was targeting Elokar. Because this happens the worst moment possible. Elokar sees his family after being away for a long time and all he finds is a baby crying in the corner and a wife consumed by an unmade. And somehow, that's not even the worst part. He could save his son at least and just as he's about to say the words, he dies. Elokar, of all people, was about to become a radiant and he got interrupted. A journey before somebody kills Moash for me. Kaladin is a lost cause. I bet you he's still gonna call Moash his friend after this. So, Adeline, son, I'm gonna need you to continue your justice warrior duty and stab Moash in the eye. Both eyes, please. Maybe add a couple vital organs just to be sure. You know what? I'll help you. Come here, Moash. I'm throwing a party in your honor. The good old French way. I took a break after that, thinking that maybe Maybe closing the book for a while would undo what just happened, but no, it only gets worse. Kaladin is having a mental breakdown. Me too, buddy. And Adeline and Asia are watching while Shallan fails to open the oath gate. And they are yeeted out to Shadesmar somehow. Asia's first reaction is, oh no, I hate this place. Oh, so you've been here before, strange woman, taking note of that. But I can't care about this seemingly fleeting remark right this second, because I don't like this place either. And not because I'm worried about our friends, I'm sure they can manage. I'm more worried about the amount of time Shadesmar gonna take us. And sure enough, <sighs> see you in part four. We're apparently using the interlude to build Benly's storyline, so here she goes again and this time she's performing. Looks like the Fuse decided to use her as their own personal wit, so now she goes places and preaches to the Parchment, trying to feed the rebellion with false narratives while also enslaving them still? Not sure how that adds up, but okay. To Benly's credit, she's not fully convinced by the actions of the Fused and even thinks humans deserve to live. As a human, I say no, but okay, Venli 
Thank you, that's very nice. Say hi to your Paulson and her pouch prisons brand for me. Next up is Mem, the laundry lady that I wish I could hire because my laundry has been piling up for months and I'm in danger of suffocating under the mountain of dirty clothes. Mem, the wash girl, has an assistant, Pom, and they both go into the quarters of their master. Guess who that is? It's Mraes. What? And Pom destroys one of his Herald paintings. What? And Mraes sees her and he doesn't care? What? I'm as confused as Mem here, especially when Mraes calls Pom an ancient one. And for some reason, Pom is interested when he mentions Tom. And yeah. This all makes sense. Going back to an interlude that probably happened two whole books ago, it's quite easy to put together what's happening here. It was basically a woman going around and destroying paintings, more specifically paintings of heralds. And as soon as it happened to this interlude, I remembered that. And I immediately assumed it was the same person. And yes, it is. Pum is a herald that hates the fact that people worship heralds. So she goes around and destroys paintings of them and especially of her. That's why she stabbed this painting. That's how Marais was able to attract her around here, and that's why and that's why she's interested in finding Tom. Crazy things. So much crazy. Always remember the interludes. Always. Last interlude point of view makes zero sense to me. Sheller guy is captured by a group of Herdasians who offer him three awful ways to die and he unintentionally chooses the worst. That's pretty much it. I guess I wasn't in the mood to investigate because I turned the page without thinking much about it. If there were any pieces to put together, I'm leaving them on the side I guess until this interlude finally makes sense in a book or two. This part is slow. Why are you doing this to me? The only interesting thing happening in Shadesmar is still wearing a f***ing poncho. You know what? Let's forget about Shadesmar for a second. Guess who's back? Zeth Sunson Truthless. No. Truthful. No. Zeth. Just Zeth. Or as he is called now, Zeth Sun Neturo. Which, of course, I accidentally kept reading as Naruto. Whatever his name is, I am so happy to see him again. My man is doing so well. Okay, his soul clings to him like, Oh, please, wait for me. Weird stuff like that happens to you when you come back from the dead. Speaking of which, it occurs to me that random guy who talked to Zeth after he was revived was Nail. Maybe. Nail, also known as Darkness, helps Zeth fit in with the Skybreakers. They had a paintball game, even. I'm no doctor or anything, but I think Kaladin needs this kind of therapy too. Zeth bested everybody and had fun. You hear me? Fun. When was the last time you felt that, or even heard the word? Hmm? I don't think the word fun is included in any of the radiant ideals, but it's fine because it doesn't keep Zeth from speaking, ideals, and other regular words. He's never spoken so much before and I love it. Another thing I love is Zeth's friendship with Nightblood. Can we call it that? A friendship? It's a peculiar one, for sure. And the dynamic here is one of the best in the whole series. Nightblood is still as chaotic as ever and keeps making fun of Zeth, and Zeth calls calls him Sword Mimi, which is way too cute of a name for a sword big to destroy stuff all the time. Maybe Nightblood should start working on destroying evil? as we commonly call it, the human race. Yasna broke the news. Her studying revealed that Boshar was originally inhabited by Parshmen and humans were the ones to come from a different planet to invade them because they destroyed their planet and it's the Radiant's fault. The ancient texts confirm what we all already knew deep down. We, humans, are a collective piece of shit. And I'm like, yeah, of course. Have you ever been to school? The entire history of humankind is about humans invading each other's territories. It's like, our specialty. Have you heard of Elon Musk wanting to create a colony on Mars? Dude, this stuff is not in the realm of fiction anymore. If Musk succeeds, we'll probably soon become the void bringers to our galaxy's parchment. Back to the Shades Mar shenanigans. Let me skip everything that happens, because the only real action happening is a void sprint sitting a ship on fire. I will instead talk to you about another theory of mine. Throw back to my Words of Radiance video in which I started and led a very serious investigation. I call it the world hopper hunt. I don't actively look for world hoppers, which defeats the purpose of a hunt, I know, shut up. And when I have a suspect, I don't let go until I'm proven right or wrong. The first culprit I caught was... The hell is f 
basher. Case closed. And right after that, I said, You and I know that he wasn't alone, which means Vivena must be around too. And for that reason, let's zoom in on Asia. Asia was easy to suspect. It even felt like she was trying to be suspected of something. And the scarily sharp reader that I am didn't fail to notice how out of place she was. In Cosmere terms, Asia is from another world. S -U -S now, I didn't immediately assume that I knew Asia's real identity. I bet there are countless word hoppers I missed because I didn't read yet the series they are originally from. In Asia's case, it was pretty easy to guess. Here's what gave it away to me. 1. Sanderson made sure we understood how strange of a person Asia is. I don't think there's one appearance of hers that goes without somebody describing her or thinking of her as being strange. I thought this was worth noting and it was hard to forget anyway with how often it happened. 2. There's this scene that that at first seems to exist only to fill the void that is our time spent in Shadesmar, but the scenes that feel weird or useless are usually the ones that have the most information hidden in plain sight. Everybody's bored and desperate, and Adeline decides to do this exercise routine, I guess, called kata. Asia joins and asks him where he learned this. Adeline replies that his sword master, so Zahel, taught him, and Asia says, likewise. Likewise. If she was from Roshar, said sword master could have been anybody but I already had the feeling she was a world hopper and from a writing perspective, the scene makes sense only if the identity of the swordmaster matters. And assuming Asia is referencing Zahel, aka Basher, it all makes sense perfect sense. 3. I don't like Asia, and I don't like the person I think she is. That's another thing they have in common. 4. Her hair is changing colors. Just dropping that here. 5. Asia declares, I'm from a far land, and I came to Roshar by crossing this place. Shadesmar. Oh, wow. Interesting. I haven't seen that coming. Adeline asks, why? I think you're missing a bunch of who's and where's there, Adeline, but thank you for asking. Asia answers him, I came chasing someone. Oh my god. Just Tell us who you are at this point. There's no use hiding it because you're doing a poor job hiding it. Okay, I'll stop with the suspense now. I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. Asia is Vivena. It's Vivi! I sound very happy to see her, but I'm not. Judging by how Vasher and Vivena vanished together at the end of Warbreaker and how Vasher somehow found his way to Roshar, it was safe to assume that Vivena was around here somewhere too. My theory is no longer one. I am certain. Vivena is Asia and Asia is Vivena. My questions are different now, how did Vivena and Vasher get separated? What happened that makes Vivena call Vasher a criminal? But that's an investigation for another day. For now, my second world hopper case is closed. On to another small mystery that proves that every little line matters. So there's a conversation about the Thalen gemstone reserve going on, and sweet Renarin innocently asks, how big are the gemstones? Are there any larger gemstones in the city? Naturally, people are like, why are you asking that? And that's because because I call random unexplained comment. This is important. It's gonna come up again. Write it down. Sorry, that was just a poor attempt to avoid talking about Shadesmar, but there's no escape in it in it. Our squad reaches Thalen City on the Shadesmar side, exactly where they wanted to be in order to cross the Oathgate back home. I didn't even have time to feel relieved, cause we're apparently decided to waste even more time around here. They're now facing thousands of fused. When will this end? Oh, and on the other side, everybody's canceling Dalinar. Somebody, whom we won't name, sent everybody a spam read note exposing Dalinar and his deep secrets. A couple visions he didn't make public and the fact that he's hiking now. Yeah, the tea is not that hot, but everybody drops him still. And the funny bit is that somebody was like, Oh, Dalinar, oh dear, oh my, I'm so sorry. I thought we all had the same note. Oh no, I didn't know. Somebody give this man an Oscar. So yeah, back to square one. All right, we're done. Roll the credits. Kidding, we're back. But this is really the end of part four, and thank goodness, thank the dead almighty for the... Now this is my favorite batch of interludes in this book. Finally some action. Well, not really on Venli's side. She still lives in a cave and only goes out to give the same speech over and over again because she has to. I guess she completed her hermit transformation. That's a big milestone in one's existence. And then she gets dragged onto a ship. All. Which is great because now we're with Risen. She's no longer her Babsk chicken girl. She's now master of paperwork for the queen. Which is pretty cool. That's what I thought until I got reminded that her legs don't work anymore. When your legs don't work like they used to before. 
her Babs comes to visit her. We'll call him Tim, okay? I can't deal with this shit right now. And to visit the Queen's Sphere Vault. This place has got like a dozen doors with a three number code on each one of them. This would be great for an escape room game. Anybody up for that? First, we need to get rid of that one guard because yes, my dear Ganchos, there is an imposter among us. <laughs> They waited until we reached the king's drop, the biggest ruby around, and the fused, no longer under disguise, started the killing. The real guards die one by one, Tim is bleeding, locked up in a cave, and we get to watch Risen struggle on her own because nobody from the outside can open the freaking doors with the freaking codes. They didn't think the system through, did they? Thank goodness we have an unexpected hero. Kiri Kiri. <laughs> Somebody is whispering in my ear that it's actually Cheery Cheery. Anyway, Kiri Kiri saves the day. The small Larkin grabs the gem and goes, <laughs> then turns to the fuse and goes, <laughs> and evolves to a bigger Larkin. The small cute clicking creature ate the fused. Hold up. My investigator senses were tickled just now. Weren't we talking about big gems a little while ago? Renarin, how did you know? The last interlude of the book is from the perspective of Teft. Good thing Teft could function today. Wow, so lucky. You don't have to flex on me like that. But looks like functioning doesn't shield you from awful things such as your friends bleeding out. I thought Breach 4 was relatively safe because how terrible would it be? be to lose one of its prominent members, but Bransan doesn't believe in mercy. Three bridgemen, including Rock, are attacked. One's dead, the other's unconscious, and the third is awake enough to mention a bridge form uniform holding a knife. And Teft is like, oh no, it's my coat, the one I sold. So naturally my first thought was, what? he's back to kill off his friends for some reason. I don't know, who knows what goes on in that idiot's head. But then I remembered that Moash doesn't have the bridge floor patch anymore. So who did this? It seems that whoever's wearing Teft's coat used it to infiltrate the place, so it might be a random fuse. But what for? This seems like a targeted attack, so- ah! Brain! Pain! Help! This is where the story finally picks back up. Before I get to any of the Everstorm shenanigans, I want to address the thing that shocked me the most. It had something to do with Renarin. I'm dying to know more about my order. I can't believe that you guys, all of you ganchos, watched me fawn over him for so long without saying a single word. You must have been shaking. I admire and thank your resolve to not spoil me. You probably knew that the secret you were keeping from me would destroy me and so you just sat back and waited for it to unfold. It being... Renarin is no truth watcher. Oh, hell no. You guys, I'm, I'm not even kidding anymore. I am truly upset. All this time, I felt a special connection to Renarin and I was so happy to be in the same order as him and now you're telling me that it was all a lie. He's not a truth watcher. He's not even a radiant. Somebody just stabbed me through the heart. That will hurt less. My life is ruined! It is revealed that Renarin has some weird odium sickness. Gliss is actually a void sprint and Renarin has been able to see the future, which is a big no-no. This explains why he's been asking about Thalen's big gemstones earlier. I assume he knew it would play a major part in the Everstorm and why he's been freaking out so much even before that. What he saw just now is terrifying. First, Delinar is losing against Odium. Spoiler, that doesn't happen. Yasna killing Renarin right here, right now. Spoiler, that doesn't happen, but I swear I believed it for a second. So Renarin's visions can be wrong, which wasn't the case before, and this is even more stressful than just having visions. Imagine seeing a bunch of stuff and not knowing which one will actually happen, if at all. Somebody call an ambulance. This sounds like ATM intoxication to me. At least this mess gives us a worthwhile scene. I didn't actually believe that Renarin would die. That would be such a waste of a character. But the question remained. How how would he avoid Yasna's stabby stab? Because yes, to me Yasna is cold hearted enough to do something like this. Well, she proved me wrong. Yasna hugs Renarin, and even Ivory interjects saying, Yasna, this is right. It is not the logical thing to do, but it feels right. Yes! You guys finally get it. Logic can only take you so far. You need to make room for emotion too. Emotion? is not weakness. As a very emotional person myself, of course I would say that, but I knew a Yasna that discarded all forms of feelings because they threatened her number one super smart student status reputation and I'm just like, how sad.
Much rather people think of me as a sappy idiot than feign numbness and feel miserable on the inside. Wow, that was quite a tangent. All of this to say, Yasna annoys me from time to time, but she is growing as a character and I'm proud of her. Moving on to, I guess, more pressing issues than Yasna's level of empathy, such as the Everstorm. Which brings me to Dalinar. You might be wondering why I've been avoiding the flashbacks of this book this whole time. Oathbringer is, after all, all about Dalinar. But oh no, I was not avoiding them. I've just been keeping my thoughts on the matter for a better occasion and they're about to crawl out and jump on you like an army of angry Kremlings. Dalinar's flashbacks basically consist of 1. Being bloodthirsty 2. Being Navani thirsty 3. Being a terrible parent and husband. Now let me elaborate. Interesting to see Dalinar under the influence of the thrill. What is the thrill? Where does it come from? How does it affect you? Who does it affect? Lots of good questions raised, but after two or three big fight scenes, I got a little bored. Now, of course, this violence-filled era is at the core of Dalinar's life, but I wanted more insight on Dalinar's character. And the first flashbacks were just a bunch of men bonking each other on the head. A bigger focus on Dalinar as a person eventually comes to and I almost regret it, ever wishing for this because boy was it thrilling, but the wrong way. Navani, the pinnacle of Alethi womanhood. Gorgeous, intelligence, witty, passionate, pious, good mother, and many, many more qualities. She's the hottest woman around, okay? But I swear, if Dalinar calls her beautiful one more time, I will lose my f***ing mind. In those flashbacks, Navani appears. Almighty above, she's so beautiful. Man, I wish she was mine. She's so beautiful. But my brother's got her because she's beautiful. I would gladly exchange my blonde poo poo head of a wife with beautiful Navani, that's for sure. Every single time. Look, I get it. I'm in love with her, but she's married to someone else. It sucks, it hurts, I get it. But will you get over it, please? I don't need you fawning over her every line on the page. I promise you like her, I get it. It's even more annoying when I know that they are married in the present. It's like, Shut up! If you think I sounded mad just now, you're not wrong. But here's what truly made me angry. Dalinar's relationship to his family. Gosh, where do I start? Remember? Shh, 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 shh. She has a name now. I mean, don't get me wrong. Shh, 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 shh. Is a beautiful name. But her real one is Eevee. Wow, amazing! My favorite Pokemon has always been Eevee. I know it's supposed to be Evie, but I like calling her Eevee. From her first appearance, I knew she was too pure and sweet for this world. And yeah, she was done so dirty. Evie leaves her home for a politically arranged marriage, fun times, and she ends up in a place so culturally different that she's constantly seen as a foreigner. And dude, I know what it's like to be put down just because you're from somewhere else. So Evie trying hard to be a proper Alethi and still being treated as the stupidest creature out there, I felt that. And that's why I'm so mad at Dalinar. She made a big sacrifice only to end up with a man that's smitten with another woman. The heart wants what it wants, can't blame him for that. But he doesn't even appreciate the things that Evie does for him. Showing a shred of gratefulness is the least he could do. Being unhappy with each other, they created a kid. And then another one. I mean, thank you for the treasures that Adeline and Renarin are, but stop making babies to stitch up the cracks in your relationship. Thank you very much. Perhaps even more infuriating is how sad kids were treated. Dalinar is so proud of baby soldier Adeline, but at the same time, he doesn't give him much attention. Still better than the way he completely neglected Renarin, because, oh no, look at him. He can't be a soldier. He's useless. I haven't seen him in the three years of his life. Why should I care about being his dad? And what's with that stupid name anyway? All this put together, it's like, wow. Dalinar, I had so much faith in you, but you turned out to be like 99% of the men in my life. How disappointing. That's not even the worst part. An entire town burns down at the hands of the Black Thorn, and normally I would make my barbecue joke, but Evie is in there. Okay, going there was not the smartest move on her part, but did she deserve to burn alive? Absolutely not. What's wrong with you? You can't see my face right now, but I am mortified. Dalinar proceeds to cover up this whole thing because of course he does. And the only thing keeping him from drowning in his guilt is his kid's support. Probably because they don't know what you did. But what a bunch of angels. I would have been bitter. Then again, I'm an unforgiving little sh- Dalinar finds his true salvation in the Way of Kings. The book written by Brandon Sanderson. No, wait. It's the other Way of Kings written by King Nohadon. <laughs> Why did I say it like that?
This book becomes a sort of bible to Dalinar. He's got some illumination going on and he sees clearly now. So clearly he makes his way straight to the middle of a creepy forest to meet the Night Watcher. I've been waiting for this. And there was quite the surprise here because we're meeting Cultivation. She's the puppet master playing around with her Night Watcher's pren. She normally doesn't show up but she decided to grace Dalinar with her presence. She needs to be there for this special occasion. She's given Dalinar a very special present. The gift of ignorance. They say ignorance is bliss for a reason. My man's about to forget the horrible things he did to his deceased wife. He's about to forget her whole existence. Until the Night Watcher slash Cultivation decides he can no longer forget. And so what's the use of that? You're relieving this man from his trauma but then you give it back? What a fraud this is. I want a refund. So yeah, Delinar forgets until he doesn't and the rest is history. Was Delinar my favorite character to begin with? No, far from that. No offense to you Dalinar stands but he's kind of boring. Did I hate him though? No. Also far from that, he hadn't done anything terrible to my knowledge. I dislike him a little bit now that I do know more. Yeah, yeah definitely. And you know, I tried being mad at him but I couldn't. Because part of me understands, okay? I'm not completely heartless. I do acknowledge Dalinar's efforts but despite seeing that he's a better man now, I can't help being deeply disappointed. Or at least that's how I felt up until this part against all odds and against all my expectations, my very disappointment is what made me respect him even more in the end. Dude's been through some stuff and he was a bad person, let's face it. Him being a monster on the battlefields can be excused because we know he was essentially possessed by the thrill, but him mistreating his family? I took that very personally and yet he realized a couple things about himself and worked very hard to do better. Erasing his trauma wasn't the best way to do this, but he actually changed in the end and it's something than you can't expect for most people. Plus, he's about to beat up an evil god. So in short, my feelings for Dalinar are mixed. It's as good as it can get in this situation, I guess. Okay, back to the Everstorm. Dalinar is chilling with his bible in hand, waiting for his opponent in the midst of chaos. And oh look, the scoundrel's finally here. I should be afraid, but I'm not impressed. I'm just annoyed. Odium wants Delinar's pain to munch on it, probably. Did you know this was a kind of sandwich? Odium? Listen, leave Delinar alone and take my pain instead. I got so much of it. Take it, run away with it. I don't need it. Anyway, Delinar says no and Odium stomps away like a toddler throwing a tantrum. This is funny, I truly believed it would turn out that Odium's champion was Delinar all along, which fits Renarin's vision, by the way. Would be both a big plot twist for this book and an interesting storyline for the next. Some time ago, Odium was like, I'm the one that made all this happen, which led me to think he manipulated everyone. Good old ruin fashion, I like that. Anyway, that was all in my head. Now that the one person that's been ruining the atmosphere is gone, the world is a shiny ocean of stormlight. We win. We good. Wrong. There's still a hundred pages left and that's plenty of time for several things to fall flat on the face. Oh, and would you look at that. Kaladin is drowning in a sea of beads. Shallan can't open the gate, Adeline is bleeding out, entire troops are possessed and the only one doing anything useful is left going to retrieve that mysterious ruby. This is just great. F cultivations perpendicularity. Dalinar just created a brand new perpendicularity. And the squad from Shadesmar finally makes it back to the physical realm. Good job on doing nothing. Okay, I'm being unfair. They become useful afterward. Although I'm kind of distracted by Amaram choking on a sphere. And he ate that sh**. Please let him die. Kudos to Delinar for resisting an evil god and the thrill. Which now I know is an unmade. Everything is linked. Very cool. But we don't want to deal with this shit anymore. So we put the thrill in a very special prison. The King's Drop. The big gemstone coming into Delinar's hand all the way from the Thalen Reserve thanks to the fused robbers, but mostly thanks to Lyft. I'm taking this chance to say that if anything happens to Lyft, I will become a Voidbringer because she's the only joy left in these unfun lands. I can't believe that back in the Way of Kings, I read her interlude and thought, ooh, what an annoying little kid. I was so wrong. Everything's always about Kaladin or Delinor, but she's so much better than all those depressed adults, me included. Lyft is somehow even more awesome around her new friend, Zeth. Because yes, he's on our side now since he chose to obey Dalinar for his ideal. Which is another thing I have foreseen thanks to health failed descriptions. Anderson, I know you too well now. You can't escape me. And yeah, joining Dalinar after what he did to his brother is a little... Eh. 
Because all I care about right now is how great Zeph and Lyft are together. This is one thing I didn't see coming, and I absolutely love it. On one side, you've got the assassin in white, and on the other, a little girl. These two make the most unexpected yet the best duo I've ever seen. Sorry, don't know why I left Nightblood out of the equation, especially since him and Lyft like each other so much, which is absolutely hilarious to me. Together they fight fused and stone monsters and fetch the gemstone. Gotta be proud of them. I'm also proud of Ben Lee and Teft for becoming Knights Radiant. Congratulations, my friends. The weight of the world is now resting on your shoulders. Congrats to Adeline also for being chosen by Shalan. I'm glad we've come to a resolution here. Since we can't have a throuple, we had to make a choice. Seeing Vale fall for Kaladin was so awkward, especially when Adeline noticed it too. Ugh, the cringe. I didn't mention this until now, but Shalan's other personality has taken over on their own accord is scary as hell. And now I see how you guys really were not joking. Back to Adeline and Shalan. I really, really like them together. I might be biased here since they do kind of remind me of my own relationship with the now famous Cosby informant, but we found love in a hopeless place and we appreciate that. Okay, now that we had a drop of happy, let's go back to Angie. Moash! Don't you like hearing that name? It's still a big ass Kremlin, in case you were wondering. This time, he gets hired by the Fuse to go kill a god. And wouldn't you believe it? He says yes! He grabs a fancy knife he's given and strolls out into the night. Matt Cawthon, I'm gonna need you to get out of this body. But it's too late. Now Jezrean, the herald of all heralds, is dead, and the other heralds all fell unconscious. Just send Moash to frickin' damnation already. The Fuse like him. I'm gonna need all all of you Moash apologists to speak up right now and explain to me how in the world Moash did nothing wrong or I'm sending you to jail. All of you. To damnation. You know what? New rules. I've decided that. <laughs> Moash. <laughs> Moash. <laughs> the only thing that kept me from tearing the book into a million pieces is how delightful the Lopen and his little spren are. He accidentally speaks the second ideal, cusses at the Stormfather, he celebrates with Knuckle by making root gestures. Here, I'll join you. <coughs> We've something else to celebrate and it's yet another wedding. The first one was boring, the second one is non-existent. Where's the wedding? Where's the party? We only had Shalon to get in gifts and ruining her makeup, but I wanted music and dancing and love and and smooches. Oh well, I guess Shalon had a really special gift from the ghost bloods. Moray sent her a package in the shape of her brothers. What What is this feeling? I mean, I'm happy for Shalon, but I have a bad feeling about this. I can't explain it. The true celebration is the next reveal. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Picture this. We are in a huge room full of kings and queens who have no storming idea of what to do. The door slams open. Somebody's standing there. They wear a crown on their head. The new person at the head of the kingdom is a queen. And it's Yasna. How? Didn't I think of this? How did nobody around Yasna think of this? She's strong, she's smart, she roasts people in the most entertaining ways, she can do diplomatics and wield a sword and I'm sure both at the same time. She's like the perfect balance of all the things the others lack. Yasna, your uncle might be unity, but I give you the right to do the thing because this is your queendom now. I hope you're ready to carry the weight of that crown because your enemy's making deals within your walls. That's right. Odium couldn't have Dalinar so he settled for for the next best thing, Terra Mike and his fluctuating IQ. It's kind of hard to piece it all together when we only get small, enigmatic bits at a time, but here's a summary of Terra Mike's plan. Terra Mike knew the desolation was coming, so he visited the Night Watcher to ask for a little help, giving him the capacity to prevent the disaster and save everyone. Very noble of him, but wishes never go as planned, especially when you make them that vague. And the Night Watcher sure has fun, giving Terra Mike the capacity. Only on some days. There you go. That's why he's supernaturally smart one day and then impossibly dumb the next. He's basically got the full capacity he needs, but never all at once. Add to that the curse of having his intelligence and compassion on opposite scales. Good one, Night Watcher. Which, hey, on his absolute smartest day, Teramai could create the diagram, which I view almost as a religion at this point. His ultimate plan is making a deal with Odium. Teramai could serve the god in exchange of sparing his people, and in an attempt 
to outsmart the god, Teramike tried to become the king of everyone and everything. That way, he could save the world. And that's why he's been after Dalinar. That's why the diagram is so important. Pretty clever plan if you ignore the fact that it eventually backfires. Hedium chooses a dumb day to come visit our poor Teramike. He essentially bullies him and manages not to fall for his trap. And so, with a little play on words from Odium, we go from saving Roshar to saving only Carbran. Wow. What else did you expect from a deal with an entity called Odium that likes feasting on pain? Whatever. This encounter leads us to the epilogue. Wit is once again at the heart of the epilogue. And just like with the regular chapters, I'm not even mad. Again, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I kinda like him now. I guess he grew on me, like a fungus. Today is a new day. Wit Hoyt is kidnapping a child and talking to walls. This might sound weird, but I swear it's true. I, or at least that's what it looked like to me. I apologize on behalf of my brain for being clouded with fatigue after a thousand page long trip across pain. With the help of my Cosmere informant, I finally get it. After Kolinar's fall, Wit finds a little girl next to the body of her mom, and he convinces her to follow him with a doll. Great use of waking in there. Only to take her to parents who just lost their child. Aw, so bittersweet. This is not his only good action of the day, because he then heads to the walls. The same walls most and the parchment were breaking down. They were doing so because the fused are hunting bonded spren. Crypt you know what kind of spren uses camouflage? Cryptics! And Wit just rescued a lost and terrified cryptic, a spren that belonged to none other than Elokar. Elokar. A light weaver. Elokar the light weaver. Elokar the light weaver that never was. How was I supposed to get any of that? I guess we can say this was a very cryptic chapter. <laughs> I mean, you'd think for a detective that predicted a couple things that would be able to understand the vague account of Wit's adventures, but cloud of fatigue. He's got a peculiar brain and living in my own head is already exhausting. And exhausting it was to finally reach the words, the end of book 3 of the Stormlight Archive. Just goodness, I thought I would never see the end of this. Just like Wit fixing every little problem in the Cosmere. I guess I don't need to say it, but I'm still gonna say it. This book is so long. Painfully so. This is not the first time I complain about stories dragging out, but this sure is the first time for a Cosmere book. Maybe I'm just prematurely becoming old and cranky. Please somebody soul cast some patience for me. From what I've seen, Warsbringer tends to be the favorite in the series among the fans, so I'm sorry if I glossed over stuff that's important to you. Words of Radiance is still my personal favorite, which makes sense since it's centered on Shallan. The character I relate to a lot. Same for Kaladin in The Way of Kings. Or Nart didn't really do it for me. Or not as much. Aside from that, the book is good. We finally get some answers about the world and its past. In a slog that lasted two entire parts was very frustrating. In short, The Way of Kings is the book of cool. Words of Radiance, the book of sad. Let Oathbringer, the book of angry. Let's see. For the next book, I would like you to raise Shallan's self-esteem as a promotion for her hard work. Not too much. You wouldn't want her to turn to a Shan. I want you to make a new code for Adeline. Make sure Lyft, Seth, and Nightblood become siblings. Find somebody other than me to love Renarin unconditionally. Give Kaladin some happy brain chemicals. Oh, force Moash to lose his Mo and just turn to Ash and make Elokar retake that night radiant quiz because I think he's in the wrong order. Oh, wait. He's dead. Is there an undo button on your keyboard or something, author? You might need to push that one from time to time. Just a friendly a reminder. And on that note, I guess we're done. I'm happy I finally made this video, not only because you guys were waiting for it, but also having been through an awfully long and intense Kaladin episode recently, it was hard doing anything and I was worried I wouldn't be able to work on this video anytime soon. I am way behind on my schedule, but I did it. <laughs> the video is here. Yay! I will now proceed to read books from lovely authors who sent me their work. They've been waiting for a long time. A huge thank you for my coffee supporters. I got some radiant conchos. If you'd like to visit my page, it's linked in the description. The details of my art commissions are on there, and if you wish to send me art or review requests or anything else, slide into my DMs. I will try to do better at life, both for you guys and also for me. I may stumble and spill all my serotonin like Kaladin. I may go a little teensy tiny bit insane like Shallan, but that's alright. The most important step a person can take isn't the first one, is it? It's the next one. Always the next step. Your next step is liking this video and subscribing, and also drink water for good measure. Have a nice storm, Gancho.
against her and then yelling thanks, I'll be back and running away. I just I just pictured a little chibi Kaya kicking in my door. How do you say this? I say it. Thanks! Slams the door. Opens the door. I'll be right back. Slams the door. <laughs>